Hello, I'm Tom Rothman of 20th Century Fox. Welcome to Fox Legacy. We're happy to have you with us. Shut up, you freak! Julius, you. I said shut up! It's a manhouse! A manhouse! Did you always know that you'd be where you are in your life today? I sure as hell didn't. Or does the map of your life only makes sense looking backward, where you can see with the clarity of hindsight how each choice, each turn, triumph, or disappointment led the way to something else. So is it with some of the most iconic and enduring films of all time. They cannot be imagined now in ways other than as they are, but because the creation of films, like the journeys of our lives, are made up of countless starts and fits and twists and turns, the results are often inevitable only in retrospect. And only those films where luck and skill and perseverance through that journey led to greatness endure. The rest are fast forgotten. So it is with tonight's iconic movie, Planet of the Apes. This 1968 film is pivotal in cinematic history for many reasons. First, it rescued an entire genre, bringing sci-fi from the B-movie provinces where it had languished in the early 60s to an arena of serious ideas for serious filmmakers. It led on to progeny like Kubrick's 2001 and Clockwork Orange and Spielberg's Close Encounters, Ridley Scott's Alien and Blade Runner and many others. It also gave birth, in some ways, to the modern movie franchise system. The first Planet of the Apes was followed by four sequels, two TV series, and eventually a new reimagining by Tim Burton in 2001. But what the making of Planet of the Apes demonstrates most is that classics are often far from inevitable. And sometimes it's the very coincidences that stop a film from having an easier path to the screen than in the end make it great. So it is with Planet of the Apes and the two men most responsible for its film existence, Arthur P. Jacobs, the producer, and Richard Zanuck, the executive in charge of production of 20th Century Fox in the 1960s. They had quite a dance. In the beginning, you see, only Jacobs believed a movie could be made at all with talking apes. He'd been a publicist to the stars like Marilyn Monroe and Sinatra. And he just started moving his career into producing. He wanted to make family-friendly fare. He believed that the premise of Pierre Boulle's novel, La Planète des Singes, or Monkey Planet, could eventually command accolades, not jeers. In the beginning, Jacobs did a very quick job of convincing Dick Zanuck. Fox bought the rights of the novel for him. In short order, Jacobs attached a very strong director, J. Lee Thompson, who had directed The Guns of Navarone and Cape Fear. And he attached a very bankable movie star, Paul Newman himself, as the lead astronaut. So, on Christmas Eve, 1963, Jacobs presented the package to Richard Zanuck with a preliminary budget of $1.7 million, which was a lot of money in those days. End of the story, roll the Fox fanfare, well, no, actually. Fox put the project into turnaround, which is a term of art for studios allowing properties they own to be shopped on certain conditions to other studios. It wasn't that Zanuck didn't believe in Planet of the Apes. He found the concept captivating. But sometimes, timing is everything. At that moment, Fox was reeling from the financial disaster that was Cleopatra. Cleopatra was a movie with losses so great they would threaten the very existence of the studio. Indeed, Cleopatra brought Fox so close to ruin that the studio was forced to sell off our huge western back lot of real estate, which is a land where the office towers of Century City in West Los Angeles now reside. You know, for me, 
I always try to keep in mind when we get in trouble on a picture these days that if we have to sell off the other half of our land, I'll have nowhere to sit, so we better make hits. But in the environment of Cleopatra, it's understandable that Fox couldn't roll the dice on an expensive movie that might fare no better than the average Saturday morning serial. It was safer to choose popular genres that were the convention of the time. So Xanax Pass began a three-year odyssey where Jacobs went to every studio in town in search of the elusive green light. And everywhere he went, he was met with a mix of interest and concern. He lost his original director, but was able to attach a new one, Blake Edwards, a master of many different genres with a terrific track record of big hits, including Days of Wine and Roses, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and of course, Pink Panther. Now it was Edwards who first made one of the moves that would upgrade Planet of the Apes. He hired legendary writer Rod Serling, creator of The Twilight Zone, a TV series that itself became a cornerstone of infusing intelligence and importance into the sci-fi genre. Serling wrote 30 drafts of the script over the course of one year, and Warner Brothers became interested for a while. But ultimately, the budget was too high and they passed. So poor Arthur Jacobs was back to square one. And over time, he lost Blake Edwards, and he lost Paul Newman. But he did not give up, and he bounced back again, this time attaching Charlton Heston. Moses, Ben-Hur, El Cid himself, all wrapped up in one. Heston's presence gave the project, and in the end, the film itself, gravitas. If it was Charlton Heston, it could not be a joke. It was Heston who brought in the director, Franklin J. Schaffner. Schaffner would later go on to direct classics like Patton and Papillon. And both Heston and Schaffner loved the project and thought the script was fascinating, but neither believed it would ever get made. And so that's where things stood for two more long years. It wasn't until 1966 that Arthur Jacobs managed to get himself back in front of Dick Zanuck to again pitch Planet of the Apes. Now, this was ironic because Fox at the time was pumping large sums of money into Jacobs' own production, Dr. Doolittle, which would go on to be a big fat flop. At least it was until we remade it 30 years later as an all audience comedy with Eddie Murphy, which was a hit. Indeed, Dick Zanuck came up to me in the Fox commissary one day when we were doing that movie and said, well, now he knew he'd lived a long time in Hollywood. Why's that, Dick, I asked. He said, well, because you're remaking Dr. Doolittle, and that's the movie that got me fired, but that's a story for another episode. Now, Dick Zanuck was always a bold executive, always willing to push the limits of conventions. Films like The Detective, Myra Breckenridge, M.A.S.H., French Connection, Great White Hope, many, many others. But if he was going to invest heavily in apes, a script he liked very much and always had, he needed to be convinced that audiences would actually believe in these talking apes and not find the whole exercise comical. So Dick Zanuck decided to finance a screen test for apes under top secret conditions. Here on the very sound stage where I am standing today, Charlton Heston acted in that screen test alongside screen legend Edward G. Robinson as Dr. Zayas. James Brolin as Cornelius, and Linda Harrison, and Linda would later go on to play the savage mute Nova. Here is the very rare footage of that very first screen test. Man here is an animal. Man here was an animal. He had no civilization. He wore no clothes. He thought no thoughts. He spoke no language. Just a few feet from this tent, you found a cemetery built and filled by a civilized race, a race which, according to you, never got beyond a crawl and a couple of grunts. You found more than a cemetery, Doctor. You found a question. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, the ape or the man? Dr. Zayas, you'd better take a look at this. We found it in some kind of artificial shaft. What do you think you found, uh, Mr. Cornelius? Not found, Doctor. Lost. And I'm afraid that would be a birthright. Mama. Mama. 
they had a language. While we swung from trees, they had a language. Well, you're quite right, Mr. Thomas. We have uncovered a question. Now we must unearth an answer. So, Dick Zanuck sat through a screening of the very footage you just saw, cautiously alert to see if anyone chuckled derisively. No one did. The makeup had a long way to go before John Chambers, the man, by the way, who also designed Spock's ears, created the now legendary look of the apes. But that test made it clear that talking monkeys could, in fact, work on screen. Six more months went by before the indomitable Jacobs was yet again in front of Zanuck. This time, Jacobs pushed Zanuck using Fox's own sci-fi movie, Fantastic Voyage, which had just opened and defied box office expectations. You see, Jacobs argued, audiences are ready for something different. Fair enough, Zanuck told him. Let's wait four weeks, and if Fantastic Voyage continues to do strong business, he would take apes to his board of directors and fight for it. Well, Fantastic Voyage had legs, as we say in the movie business, which means it continued to perform week after week. And Richard Zanuck was, and I can tell you remains to this day, a man of his word. And after a battle royale with his board, Planet of the Apes finally was greenlit. Before shooting began, a key rewrite was first done by Michael Wilson, who added a socio-political angle to the script. And on this, Wilson had real perspective. He was himself a victim of the Hollywood blacklist. He'd worked on the script of Lawrence of Arabia and adapted Bull's other novel, Bridge of the River Kwai, uh, both, by the way, for my greatest idol in the movies, David Lean. But he did not receive credit for either Lawrence of Arabia or Kwai, which won the Academy Award for Best Screenplay because he was blacklisted. Bull himself was given the Oscar instead. Now, subsequently, the WGA has restored both Wilson's credits, but his properly due moment of Oscar glory is gone forever. Wilson's rewrite had added layers of depth concerning social injustice, and together with the allegorical themes of quota systems, evolution, creationism, science versus religion, nuclear danger, the film, for all its fun, and it is great fun, was a far distance from the typical disposable science fiction of the era. Planet of the Apes showed that commercial cinema and fantasy realms could indeed tackle big social issues. And all of those substantive themes coalesce in the famous ending shot of the movie, where, well, if you're someone who is seeing it for the first time tonight, I won't give it away. But if we talk after the movie, I'll fill you in on the story behind that shot, what I consider to be one of the great examples of pure visual storytelling ever. And as for iconic lines from the movie, most people remember, take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty apes. Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. But for me, I would say there are a few more devastating last lines in all of moviedom than you maniacs, god damn you all the hell. God uh, damn you! God damn you all to hell! Enjoy. The filmmakers nicknamed the Statue of Liberty shot Rosebud, a tip of the hat to Citizen Kane, its classic mystery that gets solved only at the end of the movie. Film history is a bit hazy as to who exactly came up with the idea that the astronauts were on Earth the whole time. Co-producer Mort Abrahams and Rod Serling's wife, Carol, both say that this was the product of Serling's fertile imagination, which is entirely understandable, especially since he wrote an episode of The Twilight Zone in 1960, I Shot an Arrow into the Air, it's called, with the very same conceit. But Blake Edwards says the producer, Arthur Jacobs, had the idea while they were eating lunch at a Burbank delicatessen, no less. 
They looked up from the booth, and on the wall was a picture of the Statue of Liberty. Well, whatever the source, the result is one of the most iconic moments in cinema history. It's also something that I must tell you bedeviled the hell out of us when we went to make a modern version of the film in 2001 with Tim Burton. We knew we couldn't do the same trick that the original had, and yet we also knew we had to do something. Now, the end of the Burton film, which was very controversial, has an intellectual conceit behind it, one that I think I could probably still explain to you when we show it on Fox Legacy. But it's the emotional power of the original ending that makes it so devastating. You maniacs! You blew it up! Now, if the ending of the 2001 film was not perfect, there was one aspect of that movie, which, by the way, was a big worldwide hit, grossing over $360 million, that was absolutely perfect, perfectly symmetrical. You see, when we made that movie, we had a cool script by the great Bill Broyles, and we had the supreme movie stylist, Tim Burton, to direct. But we didn't actually have a producer. So I thought about that for a while and then realized, oh, Kismet had the answer. You see, there were a lot of top producers around Hollywood desperate to work on a Tim Burton Planet of the Apes film. But there was only one producer, an Academy Award winner, in fact, who had himself commissioned the very first screen test on the very first Planet of the Apes and then greenlit that movie. So I called Dick Zanuck. You see, when Dick left Fox in the early 70s, he went on to have and continues to have an amazingly vibrant, successful producing career. His credits include Jaws, Cocoon, The Verdict, Road to Perdition, and the Best Picture winner, Driving Miss Daisy. And he's still at it today. In fact, I just spoke to him this very morning in Paris, where he's working on Tim's new film, Alice in Wonderland. You see, the pairing of Dick and Tim on Apes has led to a great continuing collaboration between them. Dick having produced Tim's films, Big Fish, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and Sweeney Todd. They're kindred creative souls, separated by a generation in Hollywood, but linked by a bunch of apes, and an idea that has endured in the popular imagination since Pierre Boulle's novel was first published in 1963. And I'm here to tell you, it ain't done yet. What about the future? I may just have saved it for you. We are very close at Fox on a new ape script. This one, a kind of prequel, a story before the first story with a return to the social thematics that marked the first one, but with an entirely contemporary setting, Earth in 2009. And if its path is smooth, I'll have the fun of working on it and telling you about it. If its journey is long, perhaps it won't be me, but someone else, another custodian with the privilege to contribute to the heritage of 20th Century Fox. In whichever case, though, if that film or any other is done well enough, if it's great, then in the end, it will seem inevitable that that was always how it was meant to be. Doctor, I'd like to kiss you goodbye. All right, but you're so damned ugly. For the Fox Movie Channel, I'm Tom Rothman, and we'll see you next time.